How are you doing? Good, good. Hi, all you wonderful women and men. It's great to have you all here tonight. I'm honored to be speaking as part of Emerging Women. And I love the courage, I think, that this format gives to us. I was listening to you earlier, Chantel, and talking about the ways in which we need to come out and we need to emerge into our transformation. So I thought I'd start out with telling you a little bit about me. So I saw Gloria Steinem speak recently, and if she can claim her age, I can tell you that I'm 56, going on 57, and according to astrology, this is my Saturn return. So there will be a lot of interesting things that will happen for me in this year, and may I tell you, they already are. I'm the oldest in my family. My partner calls me the oldest child raised by nuns because I sit inside of pretty prescribed spaces. And so part of that is important because I am really grappling with this notion of feminine leadership. I came out in high school back in the day when being gay was a mental illness. And so I've lived most of my life in this space and have watched this movement that I never thought I would see the day when there would be marriage equality. And so I sit here now, or stand in front of you now, in awe of what I see happening in the world around the ways that we can love one another and that that love can be a whole love and it can be accepted. Although my dad would tell me, Although my dad, who I love and who taught me how to play softball at a very early age, some of those would say that's an indicator that I might have been gay. <laughs> Always told me it wasn't about acceptance, it really was about just being in the world, and I love my dad for that. And yes, I sit in this space where I am one of the few women, which is sort of interesting because I work in education. And you would think, my goodness, education, women should be excelling in those fields. But in fact, I am here to tell you today that after 150 years of existence, the University of Denver has just hired a chancellor who happens to be a woman. Now there is a myth sometimes about the solidarity that women have for one another, and I think Chantel referred to that when she was talking earlier about you know, sometimes we don't know how to hold each other's spaces. But I'm feeling good about this woman. Her name is Dr. Re Rebecca Chop, and she's coming to us from Swarthmore College. She's, she's in religious studies, and so I think, hmm, there's some awesomeness there. <laughs> I love clothes. <laughs> Being as old as I am, I had the first Barbie. <laughs> and I still remember that really gorgeous kind of pink, dark purple gown, the ball gown, that you remember that. You're too young to remember that. So I, and, and I identify predominantly as Italian, although I have some African blood. And I think that it's important that as women and men, we actually celebrate our multiple identities. I'm not any one of those, I'm all of those. And I like to think that I bring those sensibilities, if you will, to the work that I do. So one of the things I'm struggling with these days, as I sit in the space that I sit in, having dedicated my life to advancing women and girls, is that I'm sitting in this space of, are we the same or are we different? So this is why this is an interesting space for me to be in. Because what everyone is saying is, there's a difference. Now, I was part of that first wave, right? That first wave of feminism. Well, maybe the second wave. I think the first wave was the suffrage movement, and the second wave was the 60s and the 70s. And so at that time, this was not about being different. This was about gaining equity. This was about saying, if I work as hard as you, and I play as hard as you, and I strive as much as you strive, then I get to win the prize too. Right? So I'm a Title IX baby. 1972, the year that Title IX was passed, I was playing softball in high school, but I didn't get a uniform, the guys did. And so Title IX was really about creating this equity. It was about creating this space where 
who we were as girls and boys could actually be honored. In Title IX, we think of Title IX a lot about sports, and Title IX is about sports, but Title IX is about so much more than that. It's about educational opportunity. If you look at the numbers of women in 1971 who were in engineering, who were in law, who were in medicine, who were going to college, period, those numbers skyrocketed. It's been 42 years since Title IX. For over 20 years, we've been half of the women attending law school. We're close to half of the women going to medical school. We are starting to make strides in engineering and computer science. Feels a bit like the last frontier, which I'm sort of disappointed about because I think the gadgets are really fun. And if I could go back to school today, I would go back and study computer science. I think it rocks, and I want more girls and women to be in those spaces. So we've had this space where we've gotten educational equity, right? And we've done it because we're going to compete with the guys. We're in. All the Ivy Leagues are open to us. All the schools are open to us. We're going to win. We're going to do this. We're going to play sports. We're going to be competitive. We are going to do this. And so here we are 42 years later after Title IX. 42 years. And I have some sobering statistics for you. So 42 years after Title IX, on average, women represent 19%, 19% of the positional leaders. We're the majority earning undergraduate, graduate, and professional degrees. We've been at this for a while. And yet, only 19% of us are in those top-level positions. In my role as a dean, probably in the mid, mid 25 26%, college and university pe presidents, 26%, Fortune 500 CEOs, 4%. In the boardrooms, we're not there. But interestingly, when we are there, when women are there, what we find is that the return on investment is greater. The employee engagement is greater. You know, for example, one of the things that we found in our study, benchmarking women's leadership in the United States, and the author and my partner is in the room. What we found is that, actually, when organizations are led by women, or a man or woman of color, Guess what happens? There are more women and men and women of color in the leadership. Isn't that interesting? That could be a difference. The other thing that we found, interestingly, is that in many cases, when we looked at something called the industry standards in a particular field, so in higher education in my world, the industry standard is when you get a lot of research dollars, right? We have a couple of authors here. One of the benchmarks is when you're a best-selling author. There are lots of different ways that industries measure the best. And what we found when we looked at who the best were, guess who the best were? Women. In many cases, women were actually outperforming men. <gasps> I had to kind of mute that when we were doing the release of the report because people kept saying, that can't be. And you know who, interestingly, we got the most pushback from? Other women. Oh, that can't be. Are you sure you did your data right? Did you count those numbers right? The study's author said, it's a descriptive study. So what we did was we actually counted people. <laughs> like we looked at who was on Sunday morning television. Why is Sunday morning television important? Besides the fact that everyone yells at each other, <laughs> which is the male model. Sunday morning news, Sunday morning is important because we actually pay attention to who is there and who's saying what about policy. And women aren't there. When it's a single person who's being interviewed, I think the numbers are something in the teens in terms of how women are represented. But when you do those roundtables, 
the, the number jumps to about 20 some odd percent. So, women are outperforming men. We're 19% of the positional leaders. We've been at this for 42 years and we're the majority of degree earners. So then I have to look at this and say, what's going on? You mentioned Lean In. Have there not been enough books out there telling us about how we're not doing the right thing? <laughs> Do you lean in? If you lean in, what happens? Can you lean in? Do you have the capacity to lean in? Do you want to lean in? There's that great book, Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office. Aren't I supposed to be nice? If I'm mean, does that mean I'm going to get the corner office? Or am I supposed to do that in a way that pushes you aside because I have to compete with you to get that corner office? The most recent book that came out is called The Confidence Code. <sighs> I don't lean in. <laughs> I have to be mean. And now, I don't have enough confidence. <laughs> but let me flip that for a minute, in all due respect to some of these authors. Because I think they're cluing in on something that we need to pay attention to. And, and, and our speakers have all said this. There's a way that we internalize the inferiority, the negativity, the embarrassment about being women. There's a way in which we say to ourselves, that can't be right. My intuition? How could I dare trust my intuition when there's facts and data? So in some ways, what these authors are tapping into is not necessarily a bad thing. Because I think what it's pointing out is it's saying to us, are we internalizing those messages that we've gotten from the moment we've put the pink blanket on to tell us that we have to be a particular way and that way isn't as good as the other way? Some days I feel like a round peg trying to fit myself into a square space. What if I am the same as some of the guys? Chantel commented earlier that I have a really strong handshake. <laughs> some of it's because I work out. <laughs> and some of it is because I have to. Because I am in rooms, I am still in rooms where I'm the only woman. Not at my college where we have more women's rooms than men's room, which is the only building I know of in the world that has more women's rooms in it. But most of the time, I am the only woman, or one of two, or one of three. And so when I'm with the guys in the suits, I feel like I got to show up and work my biceps and give them a good handshake so they know that I'm serious. But that's me buying into that male norm, right? Deep breath. So I keep fighting the good fight. My fight kind of shifts. I'm now kind of in this space that you're all pushing me into, quite frankly, which is, <laughs> I'm leaning in to the feminine. Because I hear that as not as good. Darn it, I hate that. That is so painful to me. But I'm working on it. Because I actually think that there's something to this. And I think that the compassion that I need to have for myself and that I need to have for all of you, and you need to return to me, 
is that we can all show up in our own ways and contribute. I think we have lived in a world at this point where half of us have just not been considered. And so to me, the new challenge is how do we empower and embrace and elevate those things about who we are, whether they're sometimes labeled masculine or sometimes labeled feminine, and just own them. And one of the things I love is that there are so many more men who are coming into this space. I mean, some of the best people I'm having conversations with right now about this are some of the guys I know. And bravo for them, because just like the gay and lesbian movement needed straight allies to move the marriage equality forward, guys, I need you. I don't want to be speaking to groups of just women, not that I don't love you all, <laughs> and not that you don't look fabulous. <laughs> but part of the message is that we need to be doing this together. I think that back in the day when I was doing this work, back in the 80s, I always was struck by how guys were so limited by those stereotypes too. And so I think we all need to laugh together, we need to cry together, we need to celebrate together, we need to be intuitive together, we need to get our facts together. But if only 19% of the positional leaders are women, then something about what we're doing isn't working. And so my challenge to you is to say to you, help me think through what will work. Let's not make excuses. Let's not have to have expensive nannies in order to accommodate kids. Let's acknowledge the fact that, you know, household chores exist. <laughs> and the way in which we work with all of our technology you would think we could find a way to do this better. <laughs> we have to start thinking about ways and means to enable us to have full, healthy lives. And quite frankly, to my straight friends, this is what I want you to do. I want you to have more sex because in the New York Times, <laughs> there was an article recently and it made me sad. Because if you have an egalitarian relationship, then you are 1.7 times less likely to have sex. Now, I want that stopped right now. There is no reason why an egalitarian relationship should result in less sex. I think you should have more sex. And I think you should do it with a lot of vim and vigor. And the image was amazing. They had this man and woman with their backs to one another, and guess what the color of the sheets they were laying on were? Pink. <laughs> Come on. Is that not a subtle message? We're emasculating the guy. He's on pink sheets, and he's not getting sex. I'm sorry. We're going to change that paradigm because you all need to change the world, and you need to join me in doing it. So... Thank you for letting me go a little off script. I don't typically talk about sex. <laughs> University of Denver, Heisen Women Chancellor and the Women's College Dean talks about sex. Details at 11. <laughs> <laughs>